All right, um, everyone, welcome. I would like to uh, uh, thank you for taking the time to um, attend today's uh, webinar. My name is Gadia, and I am uh, the administrator of the educational platform of TIF. Um, additionally, we also have, um, on behalf of TIF, Dr. Michael Angastignotis, who is our medical advisor here at TIF, and we also have uh, one of our patient experts, Mr. George Costandino. Um, as you all know, uh, the mission, uh, one of TIF's missions is to develop um, and um, and uh, provide a continuous education for the patients and parents who have children with thalassemia all over the world. Uh, we currently have an online course, uh, which is available for free uh, of charge, but uh, we have also organized and scheduled this series of webinars um, in order to enhance and provide additional resources to, um, to our patients. Uh, today's webinar uh, focuses on iron monitoring and we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Paul Telfler with us. Um, I'll just give you a bit of a, a short biography of um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Paul Telfler. Uh, he is a consultant in pediatric hematology at Bart's Health NHS Trust and a senior lecturer in hematology at Queen Mary University of London. Um, he obtained his medical degree at Oxford University School of Medicine and trained in hematology at the Royal Free Whittington University College Hospital, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Sick Children and North London Platt Transfusion Center. Uh, he's the clinical lead for adult and pediatric hemoglobinopathy services at the Royal London Hospital. He also leads the East London and Essex Clinical Hemoglobinopathy Network. He's currently serving as a vice chairman of the steering committee for the English National Hemoglobinopathy Screening Program and is a committee member of the UK Forum for Hemoglobin Disorders and on the Clinical Advisory Group for National Specialist Commissioning for Hemoglobin Disorders. He has also served on the writing committee for UK National Standards of Care for Thalassemia and for Sickle Cell Disease. He is an advisor to numerous organizations and also countries such as Cyprus, um, the Ministry of Health. Um, he's involved in several international multi-center uh, clinical trials in thalassemia and sickle cell disease and has published numerous articles on management of hemoglobin disorders and uh, blood transfusion. We are very honored and very thankful that um, he's giving us his time to do this uh, presentation. Before I give the floor to Dr. Telfler, I would like uh, to ask the participants if they have any questions to please post them in the, um, in the chat. Um, and Dr. Telfler will, uh, will re uh, answer your questions after we finish with the presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tefler. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Katia. Uh, thank you to uh, Mike and George at uh, the Palestinian International Federation Office uh, for asking me to give this talk. And I hope this is going to be of value to those of you um, listening in. Um, I'll, uh, th this is a plan of the talk, but I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have, and it's probably best to wait until the end of the talk, and then the, the, I believe there'll be a facility for typing in your questions, and we can try and answer some of those. Um, otherwise, you can contact me, probably via TIFF, um, to answer questions after the talk. Well, of course, uh, monitoring of the iron levels is especially important in transfusion-dependent thalassemia and also, uh, unless we forget, in people with thalassemia who are not on regular transfusions. Um, what I'm going to do today is to talk about uh, 
what are the consequences of uh, accumulation of iron uh, in these conditions. Um, but I'm going to focus on how we actually measure uh, the amount of iron overload, uh, the various uh, tests that we have, how we interpret them and what the results mean and what can be done based on those results. And that will be these practical suggestions that are based really on the guidelines that um, you'll be aware of from the Thalassemia International Federation, from the UK Thalassemia Society, and some of the uh, practice that we've kind of developed in our service in, in East London in the UK. There will be some differences in, in different parts of the world, and uh, there will be some problems with access to some of the um, uh, methods, for instance, the MRI scanning, so that uh, some of what I'm going to describe may not be available uh, where you're living and um, having your management, but don't panic because uh, a lot can be done with very simple methods, uh, providing that we all understand what we're doing and that we, um, we work according to the guidelines. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about non-transfused thalassemia as well, and then some general conclusions. So there are two mechanisms by which iron increases in the body in thalassemia, but by far the uh, major source uh, in those who are on regular transfusions is of course the blood that gets given when you go up for your blood transfusion every two to four weeks. Of course, the red blood contains hemoglobin and the hemoglobin uh, is a molecule that um, is important for transferring oxygen around the body in the red cells and it contains an iron atom uh, at its center. Um, so there are four iron atoms per hemoglobin molecule and that works out as uh, with your regular transfusion as a fair amount of iron being uh, infused into you um, with your regular transfusions. And if you calculate it over the course of a year, then it's quite considerable. So if you actually do the calculation based on what we know from the blood in a blood bag, it comes out to about between 0.3 and 0.5 milligrams of iron per kilogram of your body weight per day, uh, which is about 50, between 15 and 40 milligrams of iron per day, a little bit less in young children. And the point is that this uh, iron that goes in doesn't come out. Uh, there isn't a natural way of removing iron from the body, uh, or at least not sufficient. A little bit comes out in the urine, a little bit comes out in the poos uh, every day, but it's really very much less than what comes in um, with the blood. So unless there's some medical way of removing that iron, it is clearly going to accumulate. Um, I'll talk about non-transfused thalassemia later, but there is another mechanism in thalassemia whereby the body holds on to iron that we naturally absorb from our food. Um, so the iron rich foods, the iron is extracted and absorbed into the body and stored. And in thalassemia, um, there is a uh, dysregulation or an abnormal regulation of the iron so that the body tends to hold on to the iron that you get from your food. Um, and this, over a, a much longer period of time, um, can cause problems with iron loading. Now, what are the consequences of this iron getting into the body? Well, iron is obviously an, an element, a metallic element uh, that is called a transition metal. And the reason for that terminology is because uh, the iron can fluctuate between two um, reactive states. And th that's part of the property of iron. So that uh, when it switches from one state to the other, we call this three plus or two plus ferric or ferrous iron then that can generate uh, toxic um, uh, byproducts uh, of these chemical reactions. And if that is not controlled, then those toxic byproducts, we sometimes call these free radicals, will damage uh, the body. Now the body has its own mechanism for um, keeping the iron safe. The iron is an essential element in the functioning of the body, providing that it's there at the right amounts. 
and the body has mechanisms for making that iron stored in a safe way so it can't actually produce these free radicals. So when it's transported in the blood or in the plasma, it's bound to a protein called transferrin. And the transferrin can bind quite a lot of iron, but if there is too much iron, then it gets saturated. And then once it's become fully saturated, uh, the transferrin can no longer uh, hold onto the iron and there is free iron or what we call labile plasma iron uh, in the blood. And this is what can generate these toxic free radicals. Um, the iron also accumulates in various organs of the body, uh, notably the liver, uh, the heart, and the hormone glands, the endocrine glands. And it's through this mechanism of the free radical generation from the plasma, but also uh, free radical or toxic iron generation um, within these organs that damage occurs. And as you know, the main consequences of iron overload are uh, in, in terms of illness and, and uh, toxicity are damage in the liver. Um, so you can develop a condition called cirrhosis, which is uh, where you get severe scarring in the liver so that the liver doesn't function well. Um, overload in the heart so that you get uh, damage to the functioning of the heart, which can lead to abnormal heart rhythm and heart failure, which is a very serious complication, and damage to the hormone glands. And that can affect um, growth, uh, pubical development, fertility, uh, the, um, the handling of calcium, and uh, the thyroid gland, which is important in um, uh, controlling the body's metabolism. Um, so uh, uh, quite a wide range of different uh, toxicities or damage that we really need to avoid in, uh, in order to uh, stay safe uh, when we're giving regular transfusion. And of course, the most important of all is the heart, because we know that the, when the heart gets damaged with iron, then that can be very, very serious. People are still dying because of um, heart failure from a heart iron overload. And so um, your challenge is to um, adhere to uh, the recommended treatment, the iron chelation treatment, to, uh, to keep the iron levels at a safe level. And my and our challenge as doctors and as healthcare workers working in the field of thalassemia is to help you and to also to modify your treatment, but to measure and uh, evaluate over time the iron levels in these various organs, but also in the blood, so that we can advise and um, make sure that the, uh, the, the treatment is correct to keep the iron safe. Now, I mentioned that the, this non-transferrin bound iron or labile plasma iron uh, in the plasma is the reactive form that can cause damage, but it's actually quite difficult to measure. Um, there are some experimental techniques that can be used, but they're not yet um, validated properly for use in the clinic. So although it's an important concept that we um, understand as doctors, and I think it's important for you as patients to understand, you won't, uh, you're unlikely to get a measurement uh, uh, of your uh, non-transferrin bound iron or labile plasma iron given to you, and we wouldn't routinely measure that. However, there are other measures which are perhaps slightly more indirect but are useful in the clinic uh, in terms of monitoring the iron and, uh, uh, and, and, and treatment. And perhaps even before we think about these ways of measuring iron, um, just think about what's actually causing this iron, which is the amount of blood that you get given. And I think the first uh, thing that we should be measuring on an annual basis is the volume of blood that you get transfused. Um, and that is quite easy to do if you keep a record or your doctors and your, your healthcare team keep a record of how of the volume of blood that you get given at each transfusion. And then at the end of the year, there's a fairly, fairly simple calculation that can be used to determine the amount of iron that has come in from the blood over the course of the year. 
And that's something that we try to do routinely in our clinic, and I'll show you how we do that uh, a little bit later. But it's a fairly simple calculation, which I believe um, everybody um, should, uh, should be doing every year. So apart from the, uh, the transfusional iron uh, input from the blood, how do we measure the iron overload? I'm sure that you'll be very familiar with this blood test called serum ferritin. Um, this has been used for at least three decades now to um, evaluate over time the uh, iron overload. Uh, ferritin is a protein that's contained within the liver, uh, within some of the other cells of the body, and is actually a storage protein that helps to store and to um, render safe uh, the iron which, uh, which you have in the body. And the serum ferritin increases as the amount of iron in the body increases. So it's potentially a useful measure. Um, there are some problems though. Um, it, uh, the level of serum ferritin is not just related to the iron stores and it can potentially be unreliable. So for instance, if you have an infection, maybe a cold or a cough, if you have hepatitis or a chronic infection of some sort, or a long-term inflammatory state, state like some form of arthritis or something like that, that in itself will put up a ferritin. Uh, nothing to do with iron, it's just a, an, a, what we call an acute phase reactant. So that the serum ferritin might be high for a different reason apart from the iron. And we have to be aware of that. What we've also found through a, a lot of studies is that the amount of iron that we measure from ferritin doesn't always reflect very closely the amount of iron that we measure in the liver uh, or in the heart when we do the MRI scans, which I'll come to in just a minute. And so uh, we have to be careful about not just looking at a single serum ferritin level, but look at the trends over a period of time, perhaps over a three month or over even a year period to see whether they're going generally up or generally down. But we know we've established some um, limits and some guidelines based on the value of serum ferritin, which have proven very helpful in terms of adjusting the iron chelation and uh, in terms to a uh, with the caveats I've just, uh, I've just said, to uh, basically gauge or to grade the risk of iron overload complications. So the actual level of serum ferritin uh, and the trend in serum ferritin are very important um, as part of the monitoring. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later with uh, when we talk about the actual levels that we should be aiming at. So what about the MRI scans uh, of specific organs uh, to look at the amount of iron in these organs and help guide uh, the, us to determine the risk of damage, the risk of problems, and how to adjust the iron chelation? These have been introduced over the past 20 years and have really revolutionized the management of iron overload and thalassemia. I can't tell you how much they've helped us clinicians, and I'm sure you as well, in having a clear idea of where the iron is and what needs to be done. So the first is the heart, and the I'm sure you'll all be familiar with this um, measure, the T2 star, which um, is a, a funny kind of um, parameter or measurement. T2 star is actually a kind of um, magnetic um, uh, property that can be measured when you're doing an MRI scan in a spe very specific way. And the T2 star is very sensitive to iron in the heart muscle. Now, the thing about the T2 star is measured in milliseconds. It's not measured in the concentration of iron. And the T2 star, if it's higher, it's better. So it's rather against what you would think. The higher the level of the T2 star, the better. The lower, the more risky. Okay. Now, what you see here on the left, uh, I don't know whether you can see my pointer, but this is the MRI scan of the heart 
And that ring is the heart muscle around what we call the left ventricle, which is the pumping chamber that pumps blood around the body, the arterial side of the circulation. Now this is only mildly gray, so there isn't very much iron there. We can also see the liver on this scan and just uh, incidentally, the liver is actually very dark gray. And on this scan, the meaning of that is that there's a lot of iron in the liver. However, there's not very much iron in the heart. So this scan shows that there can be a difference between the iron loading of the different organs for rather complicated reasons that we, we kind of partially understand. But it's important to understand that uh, for you that um, measuring both organs is quite important in terms of assessing risk and the different iron collating possibilities that might help. This scan on the right, and I hope again you can see my pointer, um, shows that the heart, this ring of the left ventri ventricular wall, the left ventricular muscle here, is really dark grey. And that's because there's a lot of iron in the uh, wall of the heart. And this is dangerous because the more iron, the more risk of developing heart failure and heart um, and the heart going out of rhythm. So this is a potentially a warning sign. Now, what these pictures don't show you is the actual figure, uh, the actual T2 star value. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But it would be useful when you see your doctor in clinic to actually look at your own picture if, if you're getting these scans done to see what your heart and your liver look like. And that can be helpful in um, encouraging you to um, do your iron collation in the way that's recommended. In this scan, you can also see that the liver is actually rather light gray compared to the one on the, other, on the left. So the liver here doesn't contain much iron. So in contrast to the one on the left, the scan on the right, this patient has got a lot of heart iron, but not very much liver iron. And this might need a different kind of iron chelation, different drug, different regime to get the iron out of the heart while the liver doesn't really need very much attention. So you can see how useful this kind of scan can be for us as doctors to decide on the right treatment and to monitor what's happening with the treatment. Now, you may say, well, actually, I'm not um, able to access this kind of scan. And for people living in some parts of the world where the healthcare resources are perhaps not quite so good, um, this may not be easily, easily uh, accessible. However, um, things are changing. And there's been some work, for instance, in Thailand and in India using MRI scanning with a slightly different technique, which can be done really, really quickly and cheaply. And this study was done by a colleague of mine, Professor James Moon and his team uh, in Bangkok. And he's also done some work in some Indian centers uh, using a different, uh, what we call a T1 scan. And you can get a scan done in about five or 10 minutes and you can scan about 100 patients uh, over, a, over a week, maybe less than that. And so, of course, MRI scanners are available in just about anywhere, um, certainly in Thailand and in India, Bangladesh, um, and so it could be used for this kind of um, rapid, um, uh, quick uh, scan to make this available in other parts of the world. And, um, I'm not going to say very much more about that, but just to say that, um, that this is something that um, I'm hoping will be more accessible uh, for people living in developing countries where the standard, the, um, the kind of recommended scan isn't, isn't currently available. Well, what about the liver? The liver is a uh, large organ where iron is uh, predominantly deposited. And uh, it's deposited in the, the liver cells and in the ma macrophage cells in the liver. And this, is, th this shows 
a section of liver under the microscope stained for iron in a patient with a moderate amount of iron overload. And you can see this blue here is the iron staining. Okay, It's called a pearl stain. Um, when you do a different kind of stain, you can see some evidence of scarring. And this is the consequence, of, as I said earlier, of accumulation of iron in the liver. So this is what we want to avoid. But of course, we can't do liver biopsies. They're quite dangerous. And we don't want to do these regularly on people. So fortunately, we have uh, uh, MRI scans available to look at it. This was a really early study done in the 1970s. Um, where they did liver biopsies uh, over um, may, uh, maybe once a year or once every other year. And these were children who weren't on any iron chelation. This was before the era of desferioxamine or just when they were starting desferioxamine. And on the left here, you can see that what happens is that the scarring in the liver just gets more and more and more uh, if you don't give you any iron chelation. And this is because the iron level is building up. Um, as I said, we don't want to do liver biopsies. We want to use an MRI scan. And there are more than one method now whereby you can scan the liver to measure the iron level in the liver. The, the, the method that I would recommend, although it's not the only method, is what we call ferry scan or R2. And on the left here, you can see some MRI images from um, some patients who have different amounts of iron in the liver, okay? Now, you don't need to understand these charts too much, but it's just to show that, basically this is just to show that as the iron level increases in this particular scan, the brightness increases, and that this is actually measurable, uh, in, and you can get a figure for the amount of iron in the liver, which can be calibrated uh, or, um, read alongside what we know to be the liver iron concentration. So this one, for instance, this healthy volunteer, um, where's, where's my pointer gone? There we go. I hope you can see my pointer. So the top left, hep, the, that stands for hepatic iron concentration or liver iron concentration, 0. 0.6 milligrams per gram. That's normal, hardly any iron in the liver. This one here, patient with E thalassemia, quite a lot of iron, nine milligrams per gram. That's still okay, but it's getting high, okay? This one here, 17, that's too high. And you can see that that's um, measurable because it's got even brighter. And this one, even higher still, 28. Can you see? So this is, there is a kind of linear uh, relationship between this parameter and the iron over the range of values that we tend to see in the clinic. So that's the liver iron. And as I say, the, the method that we uh, would um, um, most recommend is ferry scan. It is quite expensive and may not be available every, everywhere. There are alternative methodologies, for instance, a method we call T2 star. Um, there are some issues around how well that um, is what we call calibrated. But I think if you are having T2 stars of the liver in your clinic, then as long as you're having them done on the same scanner using the same technique, then having the serial measurements and comparing one measurement with the last one um, is fine. Are there any other organs that we can scan to look at iron levels? Well, yes, there are. And there's been some research done, for instance, on the pancreas, on the pituitary, and the kidneys, you name it. And some of these organs are important because they're sites where iron can cause damage and lead to uh, deficiencies, for instance, with diabetes, uh, with uh, pituitary hormones. But these methods are not very well validated. Uh, by that, I mean they're, they're not really suitable for general use in the clinic yet. And my recommendation is that they don't actually influence too much the treatment decisions. So they're not essential. And to be honest, we're not quite sure about how to interpret them and how to look at the specific values. So I think particularly if it's not being done in a research project or in a particular project in your service, 
Um, it's not essential to have an MRI scan of your pancreas or of your pituitary or of your spleen or whatever. The ones that are um, recommended are the heart and the liver. Well, let's talk about some practical guidelines here. I hope I'm not running too much over. Am I, am I okay for time? Yes, yeah. Yep, okay. So two or three points that uh, I, we found really useful in our service. The first is having a methodical way of recording all your values over the year for relating to transfusion and relating to your iron, iron monitoring. So this patient, um, his values over the course of the year, this was 2011 actually, have been entered onto our standard spreadsheet, okay? And what this does is it gives you all the hemoglobin levels before the transfusion, the amount of blood in terms of mills transfused, I can see there's a slight error there on the, on the spreadsheet, but never mind. The weight, the ferritin level, and some of the things that are really important in monitoring the, the toxic side effects of iron chelation, which I'm not going to go into today. But the, so there are several benefits of this. Firstly, you can really track what's happening to your hemoglobin level, and you can average it over the year. The spreadsheet has a function to do an average very easily. And you know that there are standards that we want to adhere to in terms of what should be the hemoglobin level. And this patient is doing fine, 9.9 .9 average, that's great. Amount of blood. So they've had a, we haven't actually calculated the amount of iron loading here, although it's very easy to do that. Beg your pardon, let's just go up again. But you can see we've calculated the amount of blood given. Again, on the Excel spreadsheet, there's a function for calculating that. The ferritin and calculating the average ferritin. You can see this patient is very well collated with a very low ferritin level. So this is helpful for the staff in the clinic doing the regular transfusions. For the clinician who's actually monitoring you on a three monthly or an annual basis, and for yourself in keeping a tally of where you are with your treatment. Now this slide shows what the target levels are for the ferritin, the liver iron concentration, and the myocardial or the cardiac T2 star. So I'll start with the ferritin here on the left. These are the values that you'll be familiar with. Levels over 2,500 are potentially dangerous. However, as I've said earlier on, you've got to be careful about how you interpret the ferritin, okay? And it doesn't tell us everything. And there are some people with levels well over 2,000 who actually have very little liver iron and very little heart iron. A level between 1,500 and 2,500 is okay, but really needs to improve. Between 500 and 1,500 is ideal. Some would say it should be nearer to 500, but I think that would be acceptable within those ranges. And once you go below 500, you have to be a bit careful uh, because it might be a bit too low and you might start to get problems related to um, adverse effects of the iron chelating drugs. So you need to start to wind down on the iron chelation if it goes into that range. With the liver iron, similarly, um, there are values. So a level above 15 is too high and potentially dangerous. Between 7 and 15 is okay, but it could be improved. Between 3 and 7 is good. Uh, closer to 3 is what we would like. And then below 3 is starting to get a bit low. And you, in the same way with the ferritin, you need to think about winding down on the iron chelation a bit, not stopping, but winding down. And with the heart, remember it's the other way around, so that the higher the T2 star, the better. So a T2 star of over 20 milliseconds is great. Between 10 and 20, there is iron in the heart and you need to work on getting that out because we really don't want any iron in the heart. 
less than 10, this is dangerous. It needs urgent attention with a change in iron collation and monitoring of the heart iron more frequently. How often should you do the monitoring? I would recommend the transfusion iron intake on those spreadsheets every year, the serum ferritin, every time you have a blood transfusion. Now, some, in some services, they do the ferritin every three months. That's fine. We tend to do it every month or every time you have a transfusion. Uh, the liver iron, um, and as I said, I recommend Feriscan every, every one to two years. If the liver iron is really good and the ferritin is really good, it could be done every two years to save costs. But if it's worrying, then at least once a year. And the heart iron, again, if it's really low, um, in other words, the, um, the, the T2 star is low, we get really worried and we should be intensifying the collation and repeating this at least every, well, repeating it every six months. There's no point in doing it less than six months. If the heart iron is good or there's no, no iron in the heart, then it's fine to do the heart iron every year or even every two years. This is just to show one or two of my patients um, and what's happened with good adherence to treatment and um, monitoring adjustment of their iron collation. So this is very scan, one, two, three, four, five tests done over the period 2011 to 2019. Remember we said naught to seven is good, seven to 15 could be better, above 15 is getting dangerous. This one, 27 is dangerous, 19 potentially dangerous, 20 not much change there. Something happened here and it's come right down and this was because the person really decided they needed to do something about it and really worked hard at their collation and we also adjusted the collating regime. In fact, I believe, if I remember correctly, we put on a combination iron collation regimen, which has worked really, really well, to the extent that we're going to have to think about um, uh, reducing the collation now because it's, the liver iron is getting quite low. This is another patient, and this is the ferritin, and this is over a long period of time as well, uh, and there are many, many ferritin readings here. And fortunately, on our system, we can actually track this. And you can see that these levels of 4,000, 8,000 are terrible. There's something dreadful going on here. But then something happened around 2017, 2018. Similar to the last patient, they decided they needed to do something. And they really concentrated on the iron collation. And we also made some adjustments to the collation with combination treatment. And you can see it's come right down but it's now about 1,000 or less. And this is really now very satisfactory. So you can see that you know, just with the ferritin, you don't really need this, the other scans too much now because you know that that patient has really done well with the collation. And certainly I'm not sure you really need a liver iron. You probably would still need a myocardial iron, but the ferritin tells the whole story there. I'm not going to say very much about transfusion, non-transfusion dependent fallacy because I'm running over a bit, but just to say that the ferritin and the liver iron concentration are useful, and it's probably the liver iron, the ferris scan that's the most useful. The, the target for ferritin might be a bit unreliable, and we would say about 500 would be good for ferritin, and the liver iron concentration, again, about three would be ideal. And it's unusual to get heart iron loading in non-transfused thalassemia, although it does happen in el elderly patients who um, accumulate iron over a very long time. So for non-transfused thalassemia, ch checking the ferritin every six months with a level, well, I would say less than 500, a liver iron every two to five years with a, with a level between three and seven, and myocardial iron probably not necessary uh, all that frequently. So in conclusion, uh, regular and systematic monitoring of iron overload is needed for both 
transfusion-dependent thalassemia and non-transfusion-dependent thalassemia. And this enables us and you to assess the risk of toxicity, that's damage, illness, and guides iron chelation treatment. And if you can document these results in a good format that enables you to see the trend over a long period of time, that's really, really helpful. And it helps in tracking what's happening. And it's important for you as patients to, to track your own transfusion, your hemoglobin levels, your ferritin, and your MRI scan results. And you should ask your doctor to see your results and to discuss them regularly with your visits. And you should be really discussing your results at least once every three months uh, with your doctor to make sure that you're on track. And if not, what needs to be done? So I think that's all. Uh, I'd like to thank the clinical teams and, pati and my patients and my own service here, who um, we all work together as a multidisciplinary team. Dr. Banu Kaya, Dr. Philippa Barroso, and Dr. Sarah Bennett are my consultant colleagues. Professor James Moon, who works at Bart's Health and who's do been doing this international work with the cardiac MRI. And Professor Tim Sampierre, who's based in Australia, who developed and um, runs the Ferry Scan unit for liver iron concentration. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, if I may make a comment, I I'm very happy at the way that you emphasize the need for recording and monitoring. Um, and I would certainly encourage uh, patients to keep their own spreadsheets as well. Um, uh, TIFF has developed uh, and will soon be releasing a mobile app for patients, uh, which will help them to do this and, and actually give them help with their appointments, etc. Because knowing how you're doing is an extremely important way of also keeping up your, your treatment and, and sticking to your treatment as you should. And I think this is very, uh, it's very important and thank you for uh, actually mentioning it. Um, I don't know if there are any questions from patients. Can, can yeah. I, I sure. may just come in? Is, is that spreadsheet oh. that you, sorry, yeah. uh, is that spreadsheet that you uh, have uh, presented, uh, Paul, available for patients to actually maybe use because it's already ready uh, with all the formulas and so forth? Is, uh, yeah. Mike, can we make that available? Yes, I, I, no, no problem. Um, if I mean, I, I don't want to um, kind of um, interrupt or, or um, disturb the way that uh, clinicians are working in their own services, and uh, this is um, this is something that we've developed for our service. But I, I'm I'm very happy to to share it. And um, what we found also is that, as you know, George, in the UK, we're now working in networks. And so we are monitoring um, some patients who live and, and have their transfusions in other centers, but we kind of supervise on a six monthly or an annual basis. And we, we liaise with their own clinicians, their own doctors. But in order to, for us to monitor, the only way we can do that is by seeing those results because we don't have access to the, those other hospitals information systems. So we use this all the time for monitoring and, and it really, really helps so that we can see exactly what's happening. So I, I, I would recommend it um, you know, more widely. The, the reason why I'm suggesting it, Paul, is that uh, they, there is uh, uh, many countries that do not have such a well-organized uh, national health system. And therefore a lot is reliable upon what the patient can have maybe the hospital itself keeps some form of records, but certainly not to this level. But I'm looking at it in a different manner. If the patient gets involved in recording his own numbers, it makes him be part of his treatment. And I believe that there is a lot more positive attitude. If you can see your numbers, uh, Number one, if they're bad, and therefore you realize they're bad, instead of saying, oh, that's the doctor's problem, I'm, I'm not involved, uh, which is something very easy to do if you don't want to uh, realize the, the severity of your condition. 
Uh, but on the other hand, is if you know, if you're seeing it that is coming down, it's an encouragement, um, and it's a very. It, it's not to interfere with the clinicians. It's just that to provide something for the patients. We've tried this in England when we developed yeah. the 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 um, Pilofax system, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, this is what we found that a lot of patients were interested. Yeah. I think I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, we've I know we've talked about this before, George, and, um, you know, it, yeah. it's not new. Um, and it's actually, you know, a very simple concept. Uh, if, if it would be helpful, um, maybe it's something that we could work with TIFF to make this. Um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, it may be that the TIFF app is um, is already developed and, uh, and does this. But uh, um, I think um, if if it would be helpful and you know you and TIFF feel that it would be good to develop that through TIFF I'd be very happy to collaborate over that yeah. um, whatever's um, whatever would be useful. Yeah Paul actually the TIFF app does contain all these things yeah and uh, uh, thank you for mentioning it because it's a good idea to have you go over it yourself yeah and help us. May I make two comments one uh, we have to say goodbye to Gadia. Gadia, thank you uh, I know you have to leave, uh, and thank you for giving us that excellent introduction. And okay, the second thank thing, you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dr. Bye. Uh, George, can you read the patient's questions? At my age, I uh, <laughs> sometimes can't see very clearly. <laughs> can you read the patient's questions, please, for Paul? Yes. Uh, one question is, which is the best method to reduce heart and liver iron overload, subcutaneous infusion under skin or chelation therapy through the in vein? Chelation therapy through the, did it, was that through the vein? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for that question. Obviously, uh, absolutely vital question. Um, I, I didn't really go into this because my talk was more on how you measure the iron rather than what you do about it. and. Mike, is there going to be a webinar on iron chelation treatments? And yeah. Yes, yeah. Next week. Uh, next week, I think, actually. Next week. So I, I wonder whether my, the best comment I can make is to dial in next week uh, to, <laughs> to that, because um, I think there's, there's a quite a lot of detail to this. And um, I don't want to... Um, I think it might be better to focus on questions related to iron monitoring for this um, for this particular one. But if whoever it was who asked that question it doesn't feel that they got after the webinar next week, they haven't got a good answer, then by all means get get in touch with me again. Okay. Next question. Uh, my baby ate 22 months, about 14 times blood transfusion iron. Iron is about three and a half thousand now. How can we decrease the iron? Okay, so um, I, I'm not seeing that. Quite, is the baby how, how old was the baby? Twenty two months. Twenty two months. Yes. So that's a really good question, and um, of course, it's, it's it's vitally important that um, from a young age we um, um, have a plan about how are we going to control the iron? Because there are lots of babies with thalassemia who need to start treating treatment with iron, uh, sorry, treatment with transfusion quite early on. And it sounds as though your baby probably started at about three months of age, which is not unusual. And the thing is that um, the kind of standard guidelines is, are that you don't start treatment with iron chelation until the age of two. And that is basically come from the, um, the fact that there hasn't been so much um, studies done on children aged under two, and the guidelines are a little bit vague about what to do under the age of two. Um, but I think that uh, certainly the ferritin level is high, uh, it's over a thousand, and your baby has had more than 10 transfusions, so should really be on some form of iron chelation. Uh, the question is what what you would be recommended to, to, to use. And again, I, I, I have my views about this, but I 
I'm not sure that I should um, really uh, say too much, given that you're going to have a webinar next week. And I hope that that will be included in the webinar. If it's not, and this might be something to have as a separate webinar, actually, about managing iron overload in young children. Um, so um, the, 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 the dilemma is that XJ, for instance, isn't licensed under the age of two. Um, deferoprone, um, there's actually quite good information now about using deferoprone under the age of two, although many doctors might be a little bit um, uneasy about using it. So the standard would be to use desferoxamine, which is the injection, but injections um, are always going to be difficult, particularly difficult for a child under the age of two. And um, many parents will say, well, why can I not just use oral iron chelation rather than putting a needle into my baby every two, two, uh, every, um, every week or more than, more than every week? So I'm very happy to do a talk on that, but I think it's a rather, you know, there are various considerations there. And uh, um, so, Again, I'm going to sit on the fence a little bit, but just to say that, yes, I think that your child should be on some form of iron chelation. Yeah. Good. Okay. Next uh, question. The question is, uh, with the ferritin levels which require improvements, has the patient age taken into account? Would it change with respect to age? My daughter is three, so want to understand the acceptable levels. Well, that's, uh, I, and I probably didn't emphasize this, but of course, in a three-year-old, uh, you can't do MRI scans very easily. The only way you'd be able to do them is um, either the child was fast asleep uh, by good chance, or would de probably need to be sedated because a child at the age of three is not going to keep still for that kind of MRI scan. So our practice in my service, and I think probably... Um, widespread is that we don't actually do the MRI scans until about the age of seven when a child can be guaranteed to um, or relatively guaranteed to stay still for an MRI, MRI scan. So what we have in the young children is the ferritin, the blood test, and a clear idea of how much blood we've given them. Um, so the uh, the, what was actually the question, George? With the ferritin levels which require improvements, yes. has the, so obviously the patient has high ferritin yeah. levels. Yeah. Uh, has the patient age taken into account? Uh, will it change the, with respect to age? My daughter is three, so I want to understand the acceptable level. Uh, I see what, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so we're really talking about the ferritin in that age range. And the answer is that um, we, we, we don't um, recommend a different set of values in the young children. So again, it's quite important to try and keep the level of ferritin, um, well, between 500 and 1,500, uh, if possible. I know it's quite difficult and uh, we have this uh, in, in, in our service as well. We have quite a lot of young children and um, the ferritin is quite hard to keep within those uh, limits, but uh, we, we try. <laughs> and of course, in young children, they're often getting sick with viruses and, um, you know, runny noses. And so the ferritin can be all over the place. And you've got, your, your doctor will appreciate that, that uh, a single ferritin, particularly in a young child, can be quite unreliable because the child happens to be unwell with a cough or a cold or something at the time of the test. Okay, next question is, if the, ferret, if the serum ferritin level is 4,000, then what is the probable time of liver damage? Let the time of liver damage. Well, um, so the first thing to say is that the ferritin um, isn't necessarily um, reflecting just iron. And I made that point in the talk. So you've got to be careful about interpreting the ferritin um, and whether it's the iron is that, I mean, but assuming that the ferritin is accurately reflecting the iron, then that is uh, too high a ferritin level. What is the time course of liver damage? Well, 
It depends what you mean by liver damage. Um, but I think my, what I would say is that uh, at any time, that is too high a ferritin. And when studies have been done where um, they've done liver biopsies, which I've said we don't recommend these days generally, but the liver biopsy, the value of that is that it does really tell you what the liver damage is because you can actually look at the liver under the microscope and see the scarring. And it's the scarring that represents the liver damage. And there've been studies done in quite young children um, where you can see scarring at the age of two or three, even with ferritin levels that are, you know, kind of 2000 or so. So you can get scarring um, with a ferritin level that's, um, well, um, not terribly high ferritin level. Um, the point though, is that this kind of scarring is reversible. So it can go away if you collate well to get the iron levels down. But 400, 4,000 rather, I think, um, all other things being taken into consideration is too high and there needs to be some intensification of iron chelation because it's likely to reflect damage to the liver, to the um, other endocrine glands that will happen over time, not straight away. You've got time to work on it, but um, if it's left, then it will, there will be a problem. George, you're muted, I think. And for me, uh, uh, Paul, actually, um, mm. uh, I would worry a lot more about endoc endocrine damage. Yes, yes. Uh, and which that is not reversible. Yes, that's that is, that's a very good point, George. And the uh, so the damage to the hormone glands. Um, if we're talking, I think this was a child, was it? Who, uh, uh, I doesn't actually say. Doesn't say. Yes. So um, the endocrine damage uh, can happen quite early. Um, so we know that if the iron isn't well controlled, it can damage the pituitary in the age range three to five or six, so that you don't see the results of that until you reach the age of 10 to 20, when the pituitary damage starts to be apparent with problems with growth and pubertal development. So it's important to keep the iron under control from an early age. Thank you. Next question. Uh Hi, actually, the national guidelines and insurance coverage in Iran doesn't support us for the expense for ferritin tests no more than six months a year. And for about a year, there is no coverage, unfortunately, for MRI T2 star annually. Now, that's a problem that hmm. many countries have with regards to financial support for the I think that is a slight problem, and maybe it's something that Tiff need to um, uh, address. I would, I mean, I think six months is a bit too infrequent for ferritin, in my view. Um, three months, I think, would be acceptable, and I think that might actually be in the Tiff guidelines. Three monthly, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Three months is okay. I think six months is too long, and it, yeah. MRIs. Well, I think. I would have thought Iran would um, be able to um, provide MRI scanning for its patients, but... Yeah, there are a few centers in Iran that actually do measure iron, mm -hmm. but not, not enough to cover all patients. Yeah. And I think this is something that the local association, along with TIF, should actually be pressing for. Yeah. Well, next question, Paul. Um, sir, I am from Bangladesh. A <coughs> Question. No, no, we can't hear you well, please. Sorry? Yes, okay, now we, can, we, we couldn't hear you well. Ah, okay. Uh, sir, I am from Bangladesh, a beta thalassemia patient. My question, is there any quick iron reducing drug? <laughs> cool. Good question. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to not answer directly, but I'm going to make a point that I think is probably critical, which is that um, there are a number of different iron chelating drugs. In Bangladesh, I know that um, there are some restrictions in what you can have, but there are iron chelating drugs available. What is more important than the quick is whether you actually take them or not. And uh, the, the, the most important thing is to adhere to your treatment uh, on a regular basis every day. 
that's more important than probably more important than the particular drug or the way that it's given. And so my first advice to you would be just to adhere to your recommended treatment. And if it's not working for you, if you're getting toxicity or side effects, you need to speak to your doctor about finding another solution. But you need to be on something that is that you can take regularly um, and that doesn't, you know, that you can afford and that is um, not causing you side effects. Uh, okay, are we still okay with with, with time, everybody, um, how can we control iron overload by any food or lifestyle? Okay, well, lifestyle, I'm going to make exactly the same point again, that you've got to find a way, a lifestyle that enables you to take your treatment um, every day. So yeah. it comes back to... Uh, just adhering to your treatment. And this is, um, this is absolutely fundamental um, and trumps everything else. <laughs> um, with regard to um, other things though, um, it's true that uh, iron is in the food that we eat and that um, there is an element of iron that gets into the body as a result of what you eat. But it's relatively small compared to the transfusion and to the effects of iron chelation. However, I think it's uh, good advice to um, try to avoid uh, overdoing those foods that are very rich in iron. And the, the foods that are rich in iron and are best absorbed uh, are red meat and liver, this sort of thing, because the iron in red meat and in liver is in a form that's very easily absorbed. So I'm not saying don't have any red meat, but um, not to overdo it. The other thing that you can do is to take um, things that actually inhibit absorption of iron from the body, from the gut. And that includes things like green tea, black tea, uh, milk. Milk's very good because uh, it's a good source of vitamin D, uh, calcium, and it does inhibit iron absorption. So plenty of milk is good as well. Um, sorry, if I could actually uh, question here, Paul, a lot of people have this uh, false impression that if they don't have so many blood transfusions, uh, it helps them to reduce their um, uh, iron intake. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, they use this as a method of controlling iron. The problem is that uh, what they don't understand, as far as I am uh, concerned, and I want your comment on it, you keep a, ferritin, a, a, a hemoglobin of 7 instead of 10. That doesn't actually necessarily help you. It's worse, actually, as far as I understand, because then your body is absorbing every little bit of iron from the food you eat. And, and then you've got other problems with low hemoglobin. Is that correct? Because yes. a lot of people misunderstand this. Yes. George, I think that's absolutely right. And is that, that's an, an, another very important uh, point. Of course, in some parts of the world, um, the transfusion um, resources are limited and it may not be possible to transfuse to a level that we would we would recommend and I'm aware that this happens in various services or countries that I've had some dealings with and so I've seen this in some of the clinical trials even that um, people are transfused only to a hemoglobin of eight or seven um, which is well below what we recommend. The, the, the problem with that is that, uh, first of all, you probably still get iron overloaded more or less to the same extent. Um, and it's causing problems down the, down the line because um, you're not actually treating or controlling the other effects of thalassemia. So the bone marrow is continuing to expand, which is going to cause you problems. Um, and you're going to have all the symptoms of anemia as well. This low hemoglobin level is very debilita debilitating in terms of everyday function. 
there are some people who where transfusion can't um, never seems to get to the, the to the optimal targets and that's because the spleen is too big and the spleen can enlarge in thalassemia and in some situations this would be a need or a, a reason for doing an operation to remove the spleen but that is a really important decision that is quite um, in, important for the doctor to think very carefully about but uh, yeah okay hello okay uh, one more question i have yeah um, a question that is not directly related to the presentation given can problems in the kidneys affect iron secretion well, iron secretion, um, I think the question is about whether the iron that comes out in the urine um, could be affected by if you have kidney problems like kidney failure or something. Yeah. Uh, so that is a good question, actually. Um, it's not so much just, you know, the way that the body handles iron, but it's to do with the way that the iron comes out with the iron chelating drugs. Um, so that when we give desferoxamine, for instance, about 50% of the iron that's chelated is actually excreted in the urine and 50% comes out in the feces in, um, from the bowel. So that if you have a kidney condition and let's say um, you're not able to produce very much urine, then that's going to have a significant effect on the um, uh, removal of iron and potentially also in the toxicity of the desferoxamine. And similarly with um, ferroprox or, or, or um, deferoprone, all the iron comes out in the urine. So if you've got a kidney problem, you can't really use deferoprone at all. Um, with X-Jade, it's a slightly different uh, X-jade itself can cause damage in the kidneys, and you've got to watch for that. But if you've got renal failure, kidney failure, and you're on dialysis, then actually X-jade is quite a good iron chelator because the iron comes out in the feces entirely. And if the kidneys have been um, destroyed, then you, you don't need to worry about X-jade damaging the kidneys anymore. So that, that's another topic that probably needs a webinar. I, be, I believe that's a topic that really does need another webinar. Um, mm. yeah. yeah. Because I kidney, kidney problems are, I think, becoming more it. apparent in the more elderly um, thalassemia yeah. population. Uh, Mike, do we still have time? Can you tell us, let us know? Because there is another, lots of questions keep coming in. Or is there another way of sorting the questions that are not going to be answered? Um, yeah, uh, we can actually collect these questions and actually send them to Paul. Yeah. Um, so that they, they can be answered perhaps uh, in a different way. Uh, because obviously, yes, we are running out of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, last, last question that I, I think it's important to, to look at. Uh, because a lot of people misunderstand that you don't have to do chelation because there are home remedies uh, that can solve the chelation problem. And in fact, the question, could we control iron overload by home remedies, if anyone possibly please? Uh, he's ask, answer, asking for an answer. Uh, uh, George, uh, so, so I, uh, which one is that? Uh, at the bottom, uh, could we control iron Overload by home remedies. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, no, not really. No, I think uh, you know this is a. Um, it requires a medical or drug solution, really. Uh, if if you need to have regular blood transfusions, then home remedies are not going to solve that um, iron overload problem. You need need. Um, and, and, and I'd like that to be emphasized because a lot mm. of people keep thinking that, you know, there is ways of avoiding uh, chelation drugs mm. uh, and, and yeah. also yeah, 
Okay, uh, Mike, over to you. Question from, uh, from Luisos Pericleos. Uh, great to see you all online. May, many thanks to Dr. Temper. Could we have the, uh, the bar chart slide again for monitoring uh, creatine and liver and heart iron? So the chart I think we had in the presentation, yes? Yeah? yeah. Well, I yeah. think that the presentation is going to be shared on the TIV website. Isn't yes. It? yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, it will be available. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed, Paul. Thank you, George. Welcome. And thank you, thanks to the audience for taking such an interest. We're sorry that time has run out because there's thousands of questions, oh, well, not thousands, yes. several <laughs> questions are still there and still coming in, I'm afraid. But uh, we have to stop, I'm sorry. Uh, and we'll try and answer your questions as we go along in a different way. Well, thank thanks for the invitation much. and um, I'm delighted that it's been a help. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you, Mike. Thank thanks. you. Bye.